In this video we'll look at a classic radio, the Nordmenda Sterling Tannhäuser 57. I'll briefly cover the history of this radio and the maker Nordmenda. We'll look at the radio's features, go over the front panel controls and take a look inside. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular radio and give a demonstration of it operating. Nordmenda, short for Norddeutsch Mende Rundfunk GmbH, was one of the most respected and collectible German radio manufacturers, along with Grundig and Telefunken. The name roughly translates as Mende North German Broadcasting Incorporated. The company was formed by Martin Mende in 1947 and manufactured radios, televisions, and test equipment. It was a family business run by the founder and later his sons. Facing increasing competition from larger rivals, it was sold to the French company Thomas Brandt in 1977. The model name Tannhäuser comes from the opera by Richard Wagner. Several Nordmenda radios of that era had operatic names such as Carmen, Caruso, and Rigoletto. The full model name for this unit is the Nordmenda Sterling Tannhäuser 57 USA. It was made in Germany for the U.S. market in the 1957 model year. The original German retail price for the radio in 1957 was 478 Deutschmarks. At that time this was approximately US $114 and with inflation equivalent to almost $1,000 today. The radio is housed in a wooden case with a glass dial, plastic trim and beige grill cloth. The appearance is pretty typical of German sets of this vintage. It is larger and heavier than average. It receives AM broadcast, long wave, short wave, and FM broadcast bands. The FM is monophonic. Stereo was not introduced until the 1959 model. The AM bands use a 460 kilohertz IF frequency, and FM uses 10.7 megahertz. It has an EM35 Magic Eye tube to assist in tuning in stations, a common feature on higher end German radios. There are two bandwidth settings selected by pushing or pulling the volume knob. There are four speakers, one large one with good bass response on the front left, an electrostatic tweeter on the front right, and two mid-range speakers, one on each side of the cabinet. The bands covered are long wave from 150 to 350 kilohertz, AM broadcast from 550 to 1600 kilohertz, short wave from 5.5 to 10.5 megahertz, and FM broadcast from 88 to 108 megahertz. The tube lineup is, and these are European tube numbers, ECC85, ECH81, 2EF89, EM35, EABC80, ECC82, and 2EL84. This is the US model. As compared to the European model, I think the only visual differences is that the front and rear controls and connectors are labeled in English, and the line cord is a North American type. The input line voltage is switch selectable for several voltages so that it could be used anywhere in the world. I've read that the German model had a limited FM band that only covered 87 to 100 megahertz rather than the full 88 to 108 megahertz used in North America. It's quite large for a table radio. The dimensions are approximately 17 by 26 by 12 inches and the weight is about 15 kilograms or 33 pounds. The leftmost knob is volume, and both inner and outer knobs are attached. It only has two knobs for aesthetics to match the two on the other side. Pulling it in or out selects between narrow or wide bandwidth. The rightmost inner knob is tuning. The outer knob selects the directional antenna. The direction finder is an unusual feature. When the direction finding button is depressed, it switches to an internal antenna which is rotatable over a range of 360 degrees via the direction finding knob. An azimuth type indicator shows the orientation of the antenna. By the tuning eye, you can determine the direction of maximum signal strength. On the bottom left, there is a treble control which adjusts the high frequency response and is indicated by a marker on this treble clef indicator. At the bottom right is the bass, which controls low frequency response, which is indicated on the bass clef indicator. There are eight piano type K 
keys. With one exception, only one key is depressed at a time and selects the operation mode. Left to right, the modes are off. Phono, which selects an external phonograph input. Tape recorder, which selects an external tape input. LW for radio on the long wave band. BC for AM broadcast band reception. SW for the short wave radio band and FM for the FM or frequency modulation band. The exception is the direction finding button which toggles independently and enables the internal direction finding antenna when depressed. At the left of the AM dial is the magic eye tube. Above the dial is a set of six tone controls. Bass works independently of the others and increases bass response when depressed. The other five allow selecting one of five preset tone or frequency response modes labeled as speech, presence, orchestra, solo, or jazz. On the back left is the power cord. It was originally a cheater type plug and was missing. This one is permanently wired in. Behind a clear plastic window you can see which line voltage the unit is selected for. Next is a connection for the FM antenna, which is currently plugged into the internal antenna in the case. To the right of that are connectors for external antenna and ground. A switch here selects whether the FM antenna connector is used on all bands or on the FM band only. Behind this clear plastic window you can see the model and serial number. Next is the phono input above and tape recorder input below and to the right of that is a DIN connector for tape recorder playback. And here are their external speaker connections for both 7000 ohm and 4.5 ohm speakers. We can remove the back cover with two thumb screws and look inside. At the left is the power transformer with selectable taps for 110, 125, 150, 220, or 240 volts. It connects to the chassis via cable. Most of the circuitry is on a metal chassis with point-to-point -point wiring underneath. On the chassis can be seen the FM tuner, which is in a separate shielded compartment, the antenna connections, the direction finding antenna, which rotates, a total of nine tubes, IF transformers in metal cans, audio input and output connections, the audio output transformer, filter capacitor, and at the bottom is a terminal strip which is marked with signal names that are also useful test points. A pull-out piece of cardboard has a metallic coating for shielding. When removed, it provides access underneath to the chassis. The schematic diagram and service info is also stored here. The four speakers are the two mid-range units on either side the large bass speaker, and the high-frequency piezo speaker. The tone switches are on a separate module above the chassis. The I-tube is mounted to face the dial. You can see the complex dial cord arrangement for the separate AM and FM tuning dials in the rotatable antenna. A clutch assembly engages the appropriate dial cord and pulleys for the selected band. There's a small FM dipole antenna built in. This radio was purchased in 2005 as a gift for my father-in-law who had a similar one when he lived in Germany. 
I restored it in 2005 and presented it to him as a gift. As received, the radio was electrically complete except for a missing line cord. The cabinet was in good shape, although the top had some crazing of the varnish and wear in spots. It was quite dusty inside with no signs of any previous restoration or repairs. I had to replace the fuse and pilot lamps and put on a new line cord. When slowly powered up using a Variac, the radio seemed to be working. I searched a number of sources for a schematic diagram and was not able to find one for exactly this model. Then I found the original schematic and alignment instructions inside under the cardboard shield. It was very brittle, faded, and falling apart. I was able to piece it together, scan it, clean up the image a bit, and print it out again. I replaced the selenium rectifier unit with a modern silicon diode bridge. The selenium type are notorious for failing, burning, and causing an unbelievably bad smell. It conveniently fit onto a terminal strip. The old rectifier was disconnected but left on the chassis. I set the voltage selector for 125 volts which helps compensate for the lower voltage drop of the silicon bridge. I replaced the three large 50 microfarad power supply filter capacitors. They would not fit inside the original capacitor, so I removed the insides of the original capacitor, reinstalled it, and mounted the new ones externally under the chassis. I also replaced two smaller electrolytic caps under the chassis and one wax paper cap. The EM35 I-tube was not working. These are quite rare and hard to replace without paying an arm and a leg. I finally located one on eBay from a seller located in Argentina of all places. It's a Telefunken tube, is very bright, and appeared to be a new old stock tube in the original box. After this, the radio was considered fully restored and was given to its new owner. In February of 2016, my father-in-law passed away and the radio came back to me. The dial cord was broken on the rotating antenna. I fixed it, gave the unit a good cleaning, and lubricated the controls. It's now fully working again. Okay, let's have a little demonstration of the radio looking at the different features and trying out the different bands. I've turned it on, let it warm up for a couple minutes. It's uh, pretty stable. It doesn't have the automatic frequency control that most modern FM radios have, but once warmed up, it's pretty stable and doesn't tend to drift. So we'll start looking at the FM band. So sound quality is pretty good through the four speakers. It's a uh, single channel mono only, but has pretty good sound quality by today's standards. If you look at some of the tone controls, we've got the travel adjustment and the bass control. And then we have the separate controls on top, the bass button and the five different preset tone settings. So in tuning we can use the magic eye to help us tune the station in properly and when it's fully tuned in the eye should close to its minimum value. So we can pick up a number of stations here locally in Ottawa on the FM but band. As Esther. Esther. Now switching to the AM broadcast band, we can pick up a number of local stations here. Unfortunately, typically no music. You asked Grossi what role he would change in the NHL. Yeah. And I was just having this conversation with somebody. Another feature is the direction finding antenna. We can turn that on by pressing the direction finding button. The die hard hockey. And then by turning the outer dial here, as indicated by this azimuth indicator, 
we can tune the station in using the directional antenna and typically see the magic eye change a little bit. Yeah, you like to see 70? I would like to see 70. Mm -hmm. So we can find the best orientation on some simpler radios. You'd have to typically move the radio itself around to orient it properly for the AM station. So we could also listen to the long wave band. There isn't really much happening on long wave these days, at least that you can hear as audio. I'm just picking up some noise, uh, mostly coming from my uh, local computer network. On short wave, not too much at this time of the day. It's in the early afternoon. The 5 to 10 megahertz, not really too much active, although in the evening there would be lots of stations booming in. I should be able to pick up the local CHU time station here in Ottawa. but not too much else happening at this time of day. As was typical on these radios, there's some indication of the different shortwave bands in some of the countries that would have been broadcasting at that time, showing 31 meter, 41 meter, and 49 meter bands in countries like Germany, Switzerland, Turkey, Morocco, Japan, Norway. Many of these are still broadcasting on the air. A nice feature of this radio is that the AM and FM tuners are independent. So if you switch back to FM, Ben Hepner, the okay. dial is still at the, the frequency for the last station that was tuned in on FM. And if we switch back to AM, we would be back to the last AM station that we've been listening to. Also of note, radios of this era has the CD or civil defense indicators on the dial indicating the frequencies that people should have tuned to in the case of an emergency, in, including potentially a nuclear war. So all in all, a nice looking and nice sounding radio that's still working after over 50 years. I hope you enjoyed this look at a classic German radio from the 1950s. In a future video, we'll look at a similar 1959 model of Nordmann to Tannheuser in a console cabinet.